Hello and welcome to part B of this training video on the key updates to the SBTI's approach to Scope 3 as part of the Corporate Net Zero Standard Version 2 public consultation. My name is Hugo Ennis-Jones and I'm the Value Chains Lead at the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And in this presentation, I'll go into more depth on some of the key concepts presented in part A. The full details will all be available as part of the public consultation where we invite your valued input and feedback. To recap, in part A, we highlighted that the latest draft standard includes three main updates on scope three. Firstly, boundary setting is now based on a relevance-based approach rather than a percentage threshold. Secondly, the new alignment method offers companies more flexibility in how they set targets. And lastly, the indirect mitigation concept is introduced for cases where direct mitigation is not feasible. We'll take a look at each of these in more detail. So firstly, regarding boundary setting, to determine whether an emission source should be included in a company scope three target setting boundary, companies can follow a structured approach. Firstly, identifying significant categories, which are those that account for 5% or more of total annual scope three emissions. Within these significant categories, Companies then check for emissions intensive activities, which are defined as those that contribute 1% or more of total annual scope three emissions, or that emit more than 10,000 tons of CO2 per year. Since these activities may require separate targets from the rest of the category, they are considered individually. Companies must still check for any additional emissions intensive activities outside significant categories that meet the 1% and 10,000 tons of CO2 per year thresholds. This ensures that all relevant emission sources are captured within the target boundary. Here you can see an overview of the emissions intensive activities upstream and downstream across agriculture, industry and mining, transport, real estate, energy and fossil fuels, which companies will need to identify their level of exposure to and include in company targets where they meet the threshold for inclusion. Next, the alignment method can be used to set targets on emissions intensive activities, both upstream and downstream, using a three-step approach as an alternative to absolute and intensity reduction methods. First, companies determine how to measure alignment based on their position in the value chain. Upstream, companies will track the percentage of spending directed towards suppliers and activities that meet alignment benchmarks. For downstream emission sources, companies can track the percentage of revenue that's generated from products that meet alignment benchmarks. Next, companies identify what it means to be aligned. This can be based on the emissions intensity following the sectoral decarbonisation approach or SDA emissions reduction curve, focusing on the endpoint net zero aligned intensity rather than the full trajectory. Or non-emission based metrics which assess technology deployment rather than direct emissions. Examples might include zero emission vehicles or low emission steel, but this list may expand over time as new climate aligned technologies emerge. Third, companies must demonstrate a linear increase in alignment over time. For each emissions intensive activity, alignment should increase from the starting percentage in the base year to 100% by 2050. Here's an illustrative example of the process for alignment targets set out in the previous slide using an auto company purchasing steel. Firstly, the company commits to align procurement spend for the emissions intensive activity, in this case steel, based on a linear alignment. This could end up looking like a 23% aligned spend by 2030 and 100% aligned spend by 2050. The company can choose from two types of SBTI defined benchmarks for aligned steel based on intensity benchmarks or non emissions based indicators which we will explore in the consultation. An example might be the use of a specific technology like an electric arc furnace. 
Companies then assess alignment in a given year by assessing the proportion of procurement that's meeting that net zero benchmark. When deciding on the mitigation action for upstream emissions, the approach is determined by the traceability of the emission source. There are four cases here ranked from highest to lowest in terms of preference. In cases of high traceability, or the ideal scenario, if you like, where you know your tier one supplier and the emissions intensity of their product, the best option is to physically reduce the emission source. Here, companies can apply a robust chain of custody models such as physical segregation to ensure that the emissions are tracked and reduced at the source. If you know the tier one supplier but aren't sure which of their multiple facilities is providing the supply, the appropriate model here would be mass balance, where emissions are tracked based on supply flows, even if the exact source is uncertain. If you know the tier one supplier but aren't certain which sub suppliers they're sourcing from, though you know which suppliers they could potentially buy from, i.e. the activity pool, which is a supply shed in this case, again, a mass balance is the applicable chain of custody model. This method accounts for potential suppliers within the pool, reflecting a lower level of physical traceability within the value chain. And finally, if you have no visibility beyond tier one, making it impossible to develop a credible emissions factor using a mass balance approach, indirect mitigation may be used as an interim solution, allowing companies to meet targets when direct mitigation isn't feasible. This mitigation is reported separately from direct mitigation, it must drive measurable net zero aligned transformation that's relevant to a company's value chain and comparable to direct mitigation. It's important to note that indirect mitigation differs from beyond value chain mitigation or BVCM, which contributes to global climate mitigation for activities that are not associated with the value chain. Indirect mitigation measures are expected to adhere to quality criteria and guardrails that will be refined during the consultation process to ensure their integrity and effectiveness. Just like with upstream mitigation, the priority for downstream mitigation is to apply direct action whenever possible. However, if direct emissions reduction from the use of sold products isn't feasible, indirect mitigation may serve as an interim measure, especially when combined with broader company-wide policies. Let's consider a practical example. For a smartphone manufacturer, Direct mitigation could include actions like increasing the design efficiency of their products to reduce energy consumption during use. However, if direct reductions aren't possible, such as when the company can't track which electricity grids the devices are being charged on, indirect mitigation may be used. Additionally, it's important that companies implement broader efficiency policies alongside these mitigation efforts to ensure long-term progress towards emissions reductions. Thank you for joining me today for part B of this video. Please refer to the draft standard and our website for more information on the SBTI's approach to scope three. I'd encourage you to fill out our video feedback form to help shape the future communications about the corporate net zero standard revision. And please also fill out the public consultation survey to provide your feedback on the draft standard. Both links can be found on our website and in the video YouTube description.